In my last video, I was giving a critique of the theory of the subject. I'm now going on to make that more concrete by criticising the theory of ideology that Althusser puts forward. I'm going to have the following structure to it. I'm going to motivate this by saying why Althusser is important and what his theory is. And then we're going to critique that theory in terms of the role of ideology, what he calls interpolation, and the ahistoric character of Althusser's theory. So why is he important? Well, he's a controversial figure. For one thing, he's a murderer. He murdered his wife. Perhaps you could say he was a madman because he was able to get off lightly as a woman murderer by claiming mental disability, or maybe that just shows the the bias of the French justice system towards a famous professor. At one time he was a famous communist philosopher and a, a leading member of the French Communist Party. Later on he became a massive guru to generations of cultural studies authors rather strange development and his key paper on ideology has according to Google Scholar been cited over 13,000 times by way of comparison Ilyenkov the leading um, Soviet Marxist has been cited in English translation less than a thousand times and the leading American materialist Dennett his leading work has, has been cited 14,000 times, so puts him about the same level as, as Althusser. When he was in France, he was, his ideas were tied to Maoism. He was on the orthodox wing of the French Communist Party and later became the ideological leader of the Maoist wing. His article on on contradiction and overdetermination for example is a lengthy exegesis of Mao's on contradiction and if you look at go and use Google again to look at how often his work's been cited and in what periods what years along the bottom here we see graph giving citations in or mentions in French of Mao Zedong. And we see it peaks in the late 60s, early 70s. Althusser's uh, start wasn't as famous as early as Mao Zedong, but he went up and peaked around the same time and then dropped off sharply at the same time as Maoism was dropping off as an influence in French politics and as the vote for the French Communist Party was, was falling. So you can see that in France, at least up until this period, the start of the 21st century, Althusser's influence paralleled that of Maoism and Orthodox Communism. That was in France. If we look at the English language statistics, we some, see something different. Starts off very similarly to in France. Mao rises and falls just as it does in France. Althusser rises later in England than in France because it took a while for his works to be translated. Peaked, started to fall and then recovered enormously. His height of his influence was the end of the 1990s. Completely different from in France. This is something very striking. This was during Thatcherism. And we are have to ask, was marxist leninist orthodoxy establishing itself in England at that time? Clearly it wasn't. For the French, Althusser was the philosophy of, philosopher of a militant labour movement. For the English, he was the philosopher of literary theory, 
of a left that was based in the universities, effectively isolating itself from the great political and economic issues of the day, instead of analysing British economics, foreign policy or military policy, it concerned itself with literature, film and gender. While Thatcher proclaimed there was no alternative to the free market, British Althusserians applied what they called cultural materialism to the works of Shakespeare and other works of literature. OK then, let's look at what Althusser's theory was. It has a number of components. As he develops it in Lenin and Philosophy, he starts out by saying that you have to approach things from the standpoint of reproduction and that he takes over from Lenin the idea of the state being made up of machines or apparatuses that ensure the reproduction of existing class relations. He then extends this by saying that in addition to repressive apparatuses there are ideological ones. And he then goes on to his most controversial point, which is to say that ideology constitutes subjects. The reproduction standpoint is something he gets from capital. And he says that in order to exist, every social formation must reproduce its conditions of existence. And this involves reproducing the productive forces and the existing relations of production. That's fair enough question is how is it done? Now he attributes a big role in this to ideology and to ideological state machines and he lists a whole bunch of them. Most of them are uncontroversial. Uh, religion, education system, communications, culture, okay. Some controversy over whether political parties including the party Altus was a member of himself, the French Communist Party, or trade unions can legitimately be seen as part of the capitalist state. Um, I would doubt that. On the educational system, he says that the role of the educational system is not only to teach people technical skills, but it's also to teach them their social role and to teach people to be obedient if they're going to be workers and be commanding and know how to command if they're going to be capitalists. Again, these things are true. This, th this does happen. The question is what significance should we attribute to it? The last point is the most confusing, or at least it is to English speakers because of the odd language used. It's what is termed the interpolation of the subject. He says that ideology interpolates individuals as subjects. Now if you're a native Indi English speaker this is really weird. You're, you're going to think it means interpolate but it doesn't mean that at all. So what does interpellate mean? It's a French word, no common English usage, so let's see how the French use it. Uh, I've put up here a, a slide of a, a newspaper release on the web about the French Yellow Vest demonstrations. And it says, Yellow Vest, more than 220 arrests in Paris, of which 163 were kept in custody. Now, interpolations there means arrests or seizures by the police. And if you look at captioned photos, um, you get pictures like this. Police seizing someone quite violently. Now, Althusser himself uses an example the police interpolating people as an example of how ideology works. And 
instead of the person being physically seized by the police, he says that if the policeman shouts, hey, you there, and you stop, you have been, as he puts it, turned into a subject by the policeman saying that. Um, you've subjected yourself to his authority. Well, let's, let's allow for that. Let, let, let's allow that you have subjected yourself to authority. Of course, the police have much more direct means of subjecting French citizens to their authority. They're heavily armed. They don't hesitate to fire tear gas grenades at people, beat them over the heads. So calling out, uh, hey, you there, is the least of what they do. But according to Alteza, if you respond when a gendarme shouts, eh, vous là -bas, you're submitting yourself to police authority and have become a subject. Now, I'm going to critique this theory. Obviously, I wouldn't just set out to explain it. I'm starting out on the role of ideology. What's wrong there? Well, he overestimates the importance of ideology of capitalist production. And basically what he's doing is confusing the role of ideology in capitalism and feudalism. He makes specific claims that schools are essential for the reproduction of capitalist relations of production, which I think is false. And in the end, he misrepresents the true role of ideology, which is not to reproduce capitalist relations of production, but to reproduce capitalist political domination in the political system, in controlling how people vote. Now, why do I say he overestimates it? The point is that under capitalism, the relations of production are self-reproducing. They're reproduced by the law of value. They don't depend in any way on a belief in capitalism. Workers don't have to believe in capitalism. They can be committed socialist voters. They can be committed communists. But if they have to sell their labour to firms, they're still going to be exploited. The point is they've got no choice but to sell their labour power. They don't do it out of ideological conviction. Marx, when he's describing the sell buying and selling of labour power, says it's a very paradise of the rights of man. It's, it's a, a place where freedom, equality, property and Bentham apply. Because what you have is the voluntary contract between free agents and the agreement they come to is but the form which they give the legal expression of their common will. Equality because each enters into a relation with the other as with a simple owner of commodities and they exchange equivalent for equivalent. Property because each disposes of only of what is his own and Bentham because each looks only after himself. So the actual exchange relations of capitalism are those between equals, formal equals. Now, the actual relationship is not a real equality because the capitalist is wealthy and the worker doesn't have enough to live on. But that still doesn't stop the relationship being one of individuals and firms acting in their self-interest. Given the distribution of property, there is no other alternative to workers but to sell their labour. And when the firm sells the product at its value, it's worth more, and the firm accumulates capital, and the worker is left in the same position as before. So Marx shows that the actual value relations reproduce capitalism. They reproduce the property on the hands of the, the capitalists, and propertylessness in the hands of the workers. Now, contrast that to Althusser, who says 
that schools and ideology were needed to reproduce capitalist relations. And this is clearly wrong historically. Marx was writing Capital in the 1860s. There were no state schools in Britain at all at that time. They didn't come in until the 1880s. Yet capitalism worked fine. Rather than children being sent to school, they were sent into the mills. People sold their labour power and sold the labour power of their children because they had no alternative. It wasn't because they'd been persuaded that it was right and necessary. The actual economic relations are self-reproducing. They don't depend on ideological supports. Now, let's come to this idea of interpolation. I'm going to say that it's based on a series of unsubstantiated claims. It applies equally to both dogs and people, which is not a, a great thing for a social theory. And the claim that subjects and souls exist is pure idealism in my mind. It's attributing magical properties to words. Literally, he's saying words like the policeman saying, hey, you there, are creating a subject. And he says a subject is the same as a soul. Now, it's m maybe difficult to believe this, but he does actually say that. Now, when I say unsubstantiated claims, in his article, he claims that a policeman shouting, hey, you there, in a street is so effective that only the person the policeman intends to stop will stop and turn around their head. He claims that 90% of the time this is accurate. Now, he gives no source for his claim that 90% of the time the right person will stop. Is there any evidence for that? Won't an experienced uh, thief just go, go on walking as if they've heard nothing? Let's leave that, OK, and assume that he was right. I doubt that he's right. But even if he was right, what conclusion can you draw from someone turning their head? If you've ever owned a dog, you'll know that dogs will respond to a call. They'll turn their head to look at you. You call them twice, they'll come running to you. Now, does that mean that a dog's a subject as well? Does a dog respond to ideology? Is this the operation of ideology? Or would you not be better to understand this in terms of conditioned reflexes and operant conditioning. And if it, operant conditioning is enough to explain it for dogs, why do you have to explain someone responding to their name or responding to the word you in any other way for human beings? Why assume that it's ideology rather than conditioning that does this. Now I've got another video about the topic of subjects and I've critiqued the notion of the subject. The basic point I make in that is that subjects are a legal category. They're a legal relation. They're not something in people's heads. And the philosophical subject that philosophers like Althusser talk about. She takes over from other 19th century philosophers. Is in fact just the philosophical reflection on legal categories which are themselves reflections of production relations. And the legal category subject is quite different as to whether you are looking at feudalism or looking at capitalism. Um, if you want to understand the category subject under, under capitalism, go and read Pashukanas. On a, in a feudal system, the relationship is between a subject and their sovereign. You're subjected to the sovereign. 
is a personal relation of dependence between two people. Feudal subjects are related to feudal relations of production, which required extra economic coercion to, to bring about a surplus. Capitalist relations of production don't require extra economic coercion to bring about a surplus and don't depend on this relation of personal domination. And in capitalist relations of production, the subject is a subject of right which can, can be either a person or a firm. Either persons or firms engage in the exchange of commodities and they're both subjects in capitalist law. General Motors or BMW are subjects. They have rights. The subject is therefore a category generated by capitalist property relations and it is a category of mutual equality. It's not a category of domination as it was under feudalism. And that's because the mode of surplus extraction under capitalism doesn't depend on personal domination. It depends on the law of value, the exchange of equivalents. And this is at the root of the ahistoric character of what Althusser goes on about. He's claiming that the category subject is created by interpolation, that ideology is all about interpolation, subject and ideology are eternal, and that subjects are the same as gods or souls. Really weird stuff to get in what's supposed to be a, a Marxist philosopher. But as this passage I've put up shows, he is explicitly saying that the category of subject always existed. It's only with bourgeois ideology, he says, that it is given this name, subject, as the juridical subject. But the category, he says, of subject which may function under other names, for instance the soul in Plato as God etc, is the constitutive category of all ideology. What it whatever its historical date, since ideology has no history. Now, this is a complete inversion of the real historical process, because the word subject meant something quite different in feudal society. It meant something quite different until really the 18th century. It meant someone subject to the domination of a prince. What it means now is someone able to engage in commodity exchange. Now, what Altus is doing here is eternalizing social relations. He's saying social relations which historically were actually generated by particular modes of production have always existed and these categories reflected on by the philosophers are eternal, which is completely the opposite of a Marxist standpoint. As I say, he confused the role of ideology under feudalism and capitalism. It's not needed for the surplus extraction under capitalism. He confused the feudal subject sovereign relation with the subject to subject relations which pertain under capitalism. Uh, relations of domination are not necessary for the production relations under capitalism. It's the same word, but not the same relation. His emphasis throughout the text is on the obsolete feudal relation of domination. And when he actually deals with the concrete ideology, it's Catholicism, which is a feudal ideology. And he, he never gets to grips with the fact that under capitalism, there's a formal equivalence between subjects of right being a subject in the Candler society means being an equal. It doesn't mean being dominated. So he's a adopting a, a pre-Marxist and archaic set of propositions here. He's saying the, cap the 
the category of subject is eternal when it's actually metamorphizes with changes in production relations. Insofar as he ties it to any social relations, he ties it to the pre-bourgeois form of domination. It, whether it's domination by the state or domination by the king, who is the personification of the state. And then he projects it into people's skulls as a psychological entity. He projects the social relation as an internal effect in people's skulls. Now why assume that such a thing exists in people's skulls? Why assume that people actually are subjects rather than it just being a legal category? Because if it's projected into human skulls, is it projected into the skull of General Motors and BMW? His psychological account means he fails to mention that the dominant subjects in a capitalist country are firms, they're not human beings. And this psychological account is co completely inadequate for portraying the actual relations between subjects. I've relied on this in preparing this on Althusser's Ideology and Ideological State Apparatuses, which was in Lenin Philosophy. I also use bits of Capital and Pashukhanis' Law and Marxism.